It's the Fellowship of the Geek Show, a weekly podcast about comics, the comic book industry, and other geek pop culture. Music courtesy of Manny the Martyr. And now, on with the show! Hey there, everybody! It's the Fellowship of the Geeks podcast. My name is Thomas Schick, and joining me for this episode is Mike Marlowe. Hey, gang. Les Webster. Hello, all. And Les Newman. Hello, everybody. How are you guys doing? Hey. Hurrah. <laughs> we, told we're, you. We're we told you we'd be back. We're back. You can't get rid of us that easily. Holy cow. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Worse than Jason Voorhees. <laughs> we just won't die. Uh. Hope everybody out there is doing okay. So, what's been going on in your corner of the galaxy? Oh gosh. Well, um, I, I will publicly take a large portion of the blame for no show last week because I I went on vacation. We went to the beach. Yeah, I was told I was going on vacation this year. Because <laughs> that's kind of what it takes to get me out the door. I'm hard-headed that way. I don't like to travel. But um, we, had a good, we had a good time. We went to yeah, I can't imagine you at, at a beach. Uh, it was kind of cool. We like rented a, an umbrella with the chairs under it, and we just kind of hung out. We also learned a lot more about the Atlanta airport than we wanted to know, but, you know, <laughs> I've, I've never had to sprint like that for to catch a connecting flight in all my life. Holy cow. <laughs> it's a big airport. They have a subway in the airport, just in the airport. But anyway, a lot of people probably know that, I, but I didn't. I did it. <laughs> and we're not talking about we're not talking about a restaurant. So yeah. No, no, we're talking about an underground train. Yes. To get between. just wanted to clear to clarify that. Yeah, no, there may there yeah. may be that kind of subway too. I don't know. We didn't have time to look around. For crying out loud. We had to get. It's the great blur. It was. It was. Yeah. We had to run. Man. It was nuts. Well, welcome back. Yes, welcome back. Yay. I made it. I, I, I would make a comment about O.J. Simpson Airport, but that's probably not a good thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he was always a better runner than me anyway, so there you go. Oh, man. And I'm not sure how many people actually get that reference anymore, so. You know. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Uh, Anyway. I thought we were thinking airport. I thought it was Air- a white Bronco. <laughs> wow. <laughs> no, honestly, that's what people know him for now, though. So, yeah, Thank the, you. The, the Avis commercials, I mean, that's lost to the hist- lost to history at this point. Yeah, so. that was 100 years ago. It was. <clears throat> See, I thought that was Hertz for some reason, but it was Avis. The juice is loose. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. Appropriate comment here. <laughs> like I said, I'm sorry you brought it up. So <laughs> <laughs> we're just reminding you that you're sorry, <laughs> you know. <laughs> it's, it's, it's what we do. Uh huh. <laughs> Well, I did something different. I didn't read. I actually was read to by Neil Gaiman. Woohoo! <laughs> now you have not lived until you heard Neil Gaiman read Coraline to you. So <laughs> that's what I've been doing is listening to some of his. Um, actually, he has a lot of audio books. I didn't know that, but um, during the Prime thing, I bought a Kindle. And you get like a month free or whatever. So I've been taking advantage of that. And um, he said he's got some pretty good stuff on there. But 
Yeah. Well, some of us were on beaches. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, like I said, if 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 you're interested in some of his stuff, which like I said, he's he's got a brilliant mind. I I think um, Coraline is probably one of the most. Oh, I don't know how to just put it. Most people think Tim Burton did it. I mean, it's just that weird and kind of what <laughs> that Tim Burton can deliver, but Neil Gaiman definitely did in this book. I don't know if you guys have seen the movie, but if you have, I mean, you know how creepy it is, but I can guarantee you the book is just so much better. Of course it always is. But um, like I said, definitely check it out. If you don't have a lot of time on your hands, you can play it in the car after you listen to our podcast in your car, you know, but a lot of different options yeah. <laughs> up there. Good, good save there. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, and I also finished up um, Oblivion Song. And I can definitely see why they're making this one a movie. There's just two different worlds you can play with, and one of them is just so fantastical that you can really do anything you know so i'm very excited to see that project to see if they'll stay true to it or if i don't know (laughs) some of them are good but with that being said also tonight um actually it'll be last sunday when you guys listen to this um the preacher is back on amc so that should be pretty interesting to see where they pick that one up and where it goes from there that one that one's been done pretty well i don't know if you guys have watched any of that but it has been solid yeah it's a little unnerving at times but it's it's good yeah but the the comics were kind of that way i think that's kind of the deal yeah uh, yeah, I and I AMC is one of those that um, they don't release a lot of stuff to like Netflix and Hulu. I don't know if they have their own streaming service. I think they do. I bet they but do. But I think it's only like you can watch the latest three episodes. So there may be a pay service from them that you can get the back episodes. But so far. I could totally be wrong because I watch them on TV, but I have not seen them on Netflix or Hulu yet. Definitely not Hulu, but. And didn't didn't we just discuss that AMC just picked up? Which book was that again? Uh, Farmhand. Farmhand, yeah. Yes. That's going to be interesting. Uh, That That should be. be. Very interesting. I think they've handled the comic book movie, or uh, not movie, TV series, pretty well. The only one that I could even say that is done comparable is CW with theirs. I mean, they've just, both of them have kind of knocked it out of the park. Although, there was one that they did, um, he was like a ninja or something. And I can't remember the comic book, but I really didn't care. Backlands. And I really didn't care for that one. But I hadn't read the comic book, so maybe it was just that was the story, but I just didn't care for that one. But that's the only one that I've seen on there that I didn't care for. Well, and if we're going to talk about adaptations for stuff we haven't read, um, I can't remember which network it is that did it. Um, just just released The Boys. Oh, yeah, uh, Netflix, I think. Amazon Prime. Am- is it Amazon? Yeah. 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 yeah every, I, I have seen it all over Twitter. It's, everybody seems to really dig the show. Cool. Good. Yeah, I actually, I heard about it, but I haven't, since I've been out of touch for, like, nearly a week, I right. haven't really heard any feedback on it yet, so I was yeah. hoping. It, but. Yeah. It's... It says on my list. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
I, I, I don't think I've heard any negative. I haven't either. So. I, everything I've heard has been really, really good. Awesome. But Orange is the New Black came out, and other than listening to audiobooks, that's what I've been doing, too. <laughs> <laughs> and, of course, you can't watch that in front of the kids, so it's like try to find time when I can watch 10 minutes here and 10 minutes there. and <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Explain some of that. No. <laughs> you know what? One rant and I'll stop, guys. Now, everyone knows yeah. I watch. <laughs> <laughs> I watch kids during the day, right? One of them's two, almost three years old. Well, we watch a lot of Disney Channel and Universal Kids because from six o'clock in the morning till about six o'clock at night, it's nothing but two-year-old appropriate shows. Well, Chrysler has put out a video now called Bad Parenting, and um, it shows the parents are in this, like, minivan thing, and they're singing and dancing to um, My Milkshake's Bring All the Boys to the Yard. And the guy, he's supposed to be talking as the minivan, and he's like, oh, no, you did it with kids in the car. And then you see the kids, and they've got headphones on, and they're singing the little baby shark thing. Now, this this commercial comes on, I kid you not, at least 60 times during the day. I mean, in one show, I, I counted six times in an hour span. Six times. Dang. And my question is, if you're so outraged that they were playing this song in front of the kids in a car, why is it okay for you to play it, blast it out six times on kids' channels? You know, how do I explain to a two-year-old, you're more than milkshakes? I mean, you know, and why the milkshakes would bring all the boys to the yard. Because, I mean, they use a catchy song that is very popular with this age group right now with Baby Shark. So the kids are going to be listening and paying attention for that, you know. So, like I said, to me, it was just kind of one of those things. I don't want to go protest or anything, but it's kind of unnerving. Like, you assholes, it's, it's not okay. It's a weird choice, for sure. It is. Now, like, Channel 4, 5, totally okay, but Disney and Universal Kids, it, there's no there's no market there for them. I mean, I guess I'm the market, right. but the you've deal is, it's me the, off. It's the grown-ups. <laughs> they're, they're trying to sell cars to the grown-ups who are being forced to sit there for hours watching that crap like you. Yeah. Well, and yes, I would like to listen to Milkshakes Bring All the Boys to the Yard, but you can't with these little kids. You know, like I said, nowadays, I believe it's very important. I'm, I'm sorry, little boys, but especially for little girls to understand they're more than their body. You know, you're, you're smart, you're beautiful, you're, you, but you don't have to be beautiful. You're beautiful on the inside. You, you know what I'm saying? So to, when I'm trying to push that message, and now I've got milkshakes bringing boys to the yard. <laughs> you know, it's just hey, girls like, like milkshakes too. Oh, I right. like I like chocolate. Right. <laughs> yeah. But so yeah, it's just kind of one of those things that was I don't understand it, and I, I wish they'd quit peddling sex to our kids. All right, it's, rant over. It, it sells. <laughs> it does, but it shouldn't to our kids, you know. Yeah, Let our well. kids be kids. Let them play in the dirt, eat bugs, you know, be a kid. Don't worry about who you like or what your body looks like. Just do you. <laughs> you know? Go make that mud pie. Be a kid. I think I was in so much of a rush to grow up that I missed being a kid, you know. Uh-huh. You're not alone in that respect, though. Yeah. I know a lot of parents that will would rather plop their kid down and put a pad in their lap and let them play with that than pay attention to it. Yeah, or play a game, you know. Well, and people are always like, oh, you can't act that way. Why can't a kid act silly? If you're not hurting when you're not out in public, I mean, let them act silly. I mean, we grow up fine. 
speak for yourself. <laughs> right. That's, well, that's, that's a big statement. Jeez. Uh, you know, but, you know, I, I, I guess, yeah, I think people are in a hurry to grow their kids up, too, you know? Well, sure, it's so they don't have to be responsible anymore. Yeah. Not that that ever really works out that way, but anyway. Yeah. And you realize how much you missed when your baby hands you a baby. (laughs) Yeah, okay, rant over. I said it's just one of those that stuck in my graw. Is that correct? Craw? Craw. Craw. Stuck in my craw. I'm a drafted in Texan, so... Well, that that just brings to mind the Harry Chapin song, Flowers Are Red, about the kid that had the imagination, but it was stripped of him uh, because the teacher would say, no, don't make these flowers colors that they're not supposed to be. Flowers are red, green leaves are green. So... To strip a, a mind is, is stupid to begin with. It is. Well, uh, to, to let a child's mind just float around the fact that everything happens in a pad and it's all true is ridiculous. Yeah. Well, you mentioned Harry Chapin and because uh, uh, this whole conversation about growing up too fast, I was thinking of Cats in the Cradle. Yes, sir. Yeah. That one's good, too. And welcome to the Harry Chapin Show. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, we could do this. I, I would love to sit and talk Harry Chapin. So. Uh, uh, yeah, we actually probably could. <laughs> Put that but on the schedule. <laughs> right. Okay. We can work on that, but not tonight. Not today. No, no, not today. Okay. That'll be one of those open shows we have right now. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> so what's been going on with you, Les? We, we can't we've got through everybody's opening. So. Right, we're still in the opening. <laughs> but see, that was kind of like a group discussion, so. <laughs> yeah. well, are we recording? No. Uh. <laughs> I hope you enjoy that two-hour runtime, Mike, because yeah. you're probably going to be there again. You're going to have another one. We're going to make up for the off week by having two shows bookending it that are monstrously long. Yeah, thanks, everybody. You can just cut my rant and make it a bonus clip. <laughs> <laughs> if y'all really want to listen to this week's. <laughs> You really want to know what the hell is that all about? Here you go. <laughs> the rest of the story. <laughs> go ahead, Les. Well, I too took up a Neil Gaiman book, uh, the Graveyard Book. This was the illustrated version with. P. Craig, P. Craig Russell. And boy, I highly recommend this. This is a good read. Uh, there are eight stories in it. It follows a, a child, an infant, that uh, crawls into a graveyard the night his parents and his sister are murdered. He is taken in by the spirits in the graveyard, and the story goes from there. It is really well written. It's a award winner. Mm-hmm. It came and did. So I recommend that. I also recommend a couple of things that I saw on uh, Amazon Prime. Took in a couple of Uh, documentaries. One was uh, Papatopoulos, which is the uh, Jim Wynorski uh, documentary, or a documentary about Jim Wynorski, a man who made 
several slasher films and the like in the 90s. You know, it's, it's kind of fun to watch because the cast members are praising him, then they're berating him just on the moment switch. <laughs> I also took in Doomed, the untold story of Roger Corman's Fantastic Four. Ooh, yes, I've been wanting to watch that. That was fun. That's and awesome. I'm I'm wondering why they didn't release this in some way. Now, I do have a VHS of it, but it was such a bad copy that it started in the middle of the movie and finished, and then it would start the first of the movie about midway of the the tape. So it was just bad all around. Wow. And the third thing I watched was already brought up, The Boys. The Boys is based on a comic book. This is based on Garth Ennis' series. And yet, it is so fun to watch because in this, the superheroes are bad. Not that they're overtly bad, but they are bad. And you just, first episode, you have a shock value at the end, similar to the first episode of Game of Thrones. In Game of Thrones, the the boy that spied his mother and her consort in the tower gets pushed out the window by the consort. This has got something in it that will make you say, I want to come back and see this. So it's it's well worth the time, and they have a decent cast in it. So don't be shy to to try this one out. It's uh, it's a good time for all, except kids. <laughs> uh, maybe you'll catch a Chrysler commercial or something. Who knows? Yeah, you never know. This is the reason why that film was never uh, the Doom, uh, the Fantastic Four film was never released, <clears throat> and this may have been this, this may have been discussed in the documentary. Is it was basically filmed to maintain the rights. That yes. was that was that was the entire that was the entire reason they did that. Just like um, there was there was there was a push several years back. For um, who was it? I guess it was New Line to do another Daredevil, just so they can maintain the rights. And they said, you know what? It's not worth the effort and the resources because it, it was it, it's it was like a, a clause in the the deals that Marvel made to sell off the film the film rights and distribution rights and all that. That you know, after a certain period of time, if if you hadn't done anything, the rights revert back. So that's that was the whole purpose of that Fantastic Four film was for them to maintain. I guess it was 20th Century Fox to maintain the rights. Warren Beatty almost had something similar with Dick Tracy because he was going to try to do another Dick Tracy, and he was fighting to maintain the rights, and nothing ever came of it. So. I don't know where that is, right? I don't know if he still has it or whatever. So, but it happens every once in a while. But that's, I mean, that's the whole deal. Well, I know that Avi Arad put the kibosh to the Fantastic Four movie because they were going to make one. And uh, Corman's group was just finishing up the... Uh, their version, and, and Corman was a producer, not the director. Right. But uh, Arad said, no, just shut it down. So the, the premiere never got shown. It was, according to the documentary, it was going to be shown at the Mall of the Americas in Minnesota. Okay. 
yet they, they geared up for it, nothing ever happened. Wow. Now you can still see cast members appearing at comic book shows mm -hmm. and saying, I was Johnny Storm, I was Doctor Doom, things like that. But you look at the cast who was pretty knowledgeable in acting because you had Alex Hyde White. Oh, yeah. And you had... Uh, yeah, I'm trying to remember, remember some of the names right now. It's been a bit. Yeah, but, but you have sons and daughters of actors. Mm -hmm. The director was the son of the, the hair product person, uh, Sassoon. So there was a legacy there, especially with the actors. Yeah. They, they never got to actually say, this was my breakout movie, which was what they were hoping for. It was all squashed. Uh, yeah, Jay Underwood was Johnny Storm. Uh, yes, he was in. He was in Uncle Buck. Mm -hmm. Do you remember Bug in Uncle Buck? That was Jay Underwood. Who the hell could forget Bug in Uncle Buck? I mean, come on. <laughs> yeah. The the these. Uh, who was the other? Who's Doctor Doom? Uh, Joseph Culp. Robert Culp's boy. Yep. So, it was a, a great video to watch, and if you get the chance, take your time and watch it. Yeah, I, that's definitely one of those that I've I've been wanting to watch, but I just yeah, I just hadn't done it yet. Need to. Okay, well, for me, I've been working on fellowship things, kind of some secret, secret stuff, some secret bot side projects and that kind of thing, kind of gearing things up. And that's all you're going to get from me for right now. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> how's that for it, <laughs> <laughs> Um Also, I picked up a couple of trades. And guess what kind of trades they are, Mikey? Uh, time travel. <laughs> Marvel. No. Epic collections. There you go. Yay. Yay. There are ones I've kind of touted before. The X-Men, the most recent X-Men, which basically covers the years from when the book was canceled. So it was basically all their guest shots. And then Beast's little solo run. And then I picked up uh, a Spider-Man trade that takes place right after issue 50, I believe. So it's still early in the first couple of years of the of the run. And it's when uh, John Romita Jr. has fully taken over as, <clears throat> excuse me, as artist on the book. And it's just uh, some beautiful art. You know, of course, you've got classic villains such as Green Goblin appearing, reappearing, and then Vulture and Mysterio. Hey, good timing. I think he's in a movie or some such. Mm, but, something um, like that, yeah. Yeah. So uh, it's it's been kind of fun reading those again. So, all righty. Before we get into this week's discussion, kind of. What, by the time this comes out, uh, it would have already passed. But still, we always have we have these every month, so we always like to promote these. Uh, our meet, monthly meet and gap. Uh, it's always the second Saturday of the month, and we have it at uh, Wing City. And if you're in the Dallas Fort Worth area, you like to come uh, join us. Uh, you're more than welcome. The Wing City is located at 1456 Beltline Road, number one to Suite 20, and that's in Garland. And what we do is we just hang out for several hours, have a great discussion, have some great food. It's always a blast. Uh, we've been doing this for several months now. I guess, I guess we started back in January. Is that correct? Uh, yeah. Okay, so. All year so, long. Yeah, all year long. 
And it, it, we highly encourage y'all to come out if y'all are in the Dallas Worth area just to say hi or if you want to talk about anything that's going on in the geek universe, just, you know, comics, movies, TV, whatever, please uh, come join us. All this information is on the website, and that's www.thefellowshipofthegeeks.net. And you can click on the events tab there. And you can also go to our Facebook page, and we have a Facebook group there as well. So if you can't make it to this one, which is by the time you're listening to this, it's already passed. There will, there will be one in September. That will be the 14th. And that will be at 7 o'clock. So by all means, come join us and have some fun. All righty. This week's discussion. We were planning to do this several weeks ago, but we had we had to rearrange our schedules a little bit. So I'm I'm glad we were we actually are getting to it now. It's one of these that I've been wanting to have for quite a while. It's our Q and A episode. You supply us with a you want to ask us a question. We'd love to hear from you. We'll answer it on the episode. We've been talking about that. We've promoted it on social media, and we're finally we're finally having the opportunity to do that. So uh, for today's episode, we got we all, we're only going with two questions because we feel one of them is going to take <laughs> take, take a while to discuss, and the other one may too. Well, you never know. But uh, so just sit back and uh, just kind of enjoy it and. If this gets you uh, motivated to ask us a question, oh, by all means, shoot them our way, and we'll we may use it for the for the next one. Okay, you guys ready? Sure. Ready, Freddy. Bring it. Okay. Well, our first question came from Kate from Ignorance Was Bliss, the I I at I W B podcast. She sent this to us on Twitter. Hi, Kate. Yeah, Kate, thank you. Thank you very, very much. And the question is, what is your single geekiest moment? My whole life has been a geeky moment. <laughs> See, I, I I didn't know how to answer this because it would that be like meeting someone, like fangirling hard? or It could be. It could be. That's that's kind of mine, except for I wasn't fangirling. But <laughs> uh, you say that, yeah. I don't know if there was squealing involved. You were. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, I've never um, I've never viewed that as a gendered term anyway. Yeah. I fangirl on stuff all the time. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think they have fanboys too. So yeah, you know. Um, Go ahead. I don't, I don't know. Like I said, my my whole life has been a geeky moment. Okay. Um, um. Now I I think if I have to say in in terms of meeting someone that I kind of geeked out on, I think I've talked about it before. I think the most pleasant interaction with comic book related people would have to be Jason David Frank. I mean, he was just so nice and down to earth and literally honestly made us feel like we were the only people there, you know, and in a, com- a crowded con, it's kind of hard to make someone feel that way, especially me when I'm so aware of people around me. <laughs> but we had got there that day. I had taken my son. Now, my oldest son is like majorly Green Power Ranger, White Power Ranger fan. Um when he had a heart surgery, that was the thing we bought him was an action figure. And he swears to this day that Tommy helped him heal. So to be able to meet this kid that I've been watching all of his life grow up on my TV set, for me as a parent, it was kind of like, oh, my God, I know you, but you don't know me. <laughs> but when we got there, we found out that we couldn't buy tickets to his line because they had all sold out. So it was like, okay, but you know what? We're still going to go, and we're still going to see him because I came to this. <laughs> you know? 
So when we came up there, um, we kind of passed the line because we weren't going to stand in line because, you know, tickets were sold out. And he saw us standing there and he says, are you in line? And I said, no, actually, you know, tickets sold out and we didn't get, you know. And he's like, no, no, come here, come here. Pulled all of us over there, gave us a big hug, took pictures with us, grabbed our phone, took pictures that way. I mean, it it was just amazing. You know, he didn't have to do that. I'm sure we pissed off everybody who was standing in that line. But for me, it was just kind of one of those, oh, my God, you know, you didn't have to do that. Who the hell am I, you know? But I felt like the luckiest person in the whole room and it was the green power ranger <laughs> how kick ass is that you know so i think for me that's what it was when actually you've seen someone and like i said he's been on all of the power rangers because believe me i have watched all of the power rangers and even now i enjoy reading the comic books a little bit more because the person outside of that comic is a really awesome guy. So it's kind of made it more enjoyable, the fandom. Aww. Aww. <laughs> oh, that's cool. Yeah. That is cool. Yeah. But my geekiest faux pas was when a lady, <laughs> one of my friends posted a picture of her baby. <laughs> and she had made a reference to him being... Um, <laughs> The Dopey or Doby from Harry Potter, and I thought <laughs> I wound up calling him Gollum from Lord of the Rings. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, wow. that's what happens when you you mix your fandoms up. Yeah, don't cross the streams. <laughs> one's really cute, and one's kind of really freaking creepy. <laughs> so, but wow. yeah, yeah, I had to apologize for that one. <laughs> Ouch. I didn't mean to call your baby a troll. <laughs> but she well, it's her precious. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But see, that's what she said. It was her precious something or another, which made reference to Dobie. I picked up on precious. <laughs> Oops. But she did kind of have those bug eyes and bald head, you know. <laughs> Easy mistake. <laughs> <laughs> If you, if, you, if you look just right, there's really not a whole lot of... I mean, they're kind of similar looking, kind of, in a way, they are. sort of. Yeah, you know. Pointy it's teeth. One needs a dentist and the other's British. <laughs> I think they both are British, right? Uh, yeah, I believe so. so. Yeah. It's all in the lighting. Yeah. yeah. CGI versus mo-ca- motion capture, you know, it's it, it's once yeah. it all gets on the screen, it's hard to tell the difference. It's, it's an easy mistake to make. It is. <laughs> and her baby did grow into that forehead. So. Oh god. <laughs> <laughs> wow. This was praying every night. <laughs> Which way? Oh, please let this baby grow into this forehead. <laughs> oh. oh, man. <laughs> okay. I'll go. Um, <laughs> uh, I, now, now, now that for some reason what Liz was saying triggered something in my head, so I kind of have... So you're triggered. Okay. I, I, no, 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 no. No, 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 no. Not yet. Hey, hey, said, sure. This is, this is <laughs> the, the, the night is still young, but no. Um, okay, yeah, so my initial reaction to this was actually very similar similar to Liz's in that I was like, well, my whole damn life has been a constant string of geeky moments. I don't know really how to, which one was the most geeky is, is a little hard to narrow down. Um, the one I came up with, though, um, was... I, I don't know how y'all are going to take this. <laughs> um, honestly, coming up with the idea of and starting a podcast is probably the, one of the geekiest things I've ever done. <laughs> it just, 
there's if if for no other reason um whether it has anything to do with our subject matter or not um there's a lot of weird and interesting technical stuff that you have to figure out and i mean there's yes yeah, sure you've got the internet and you can you can google foo it and you'll learn quite a bit but that's you still there's still a lot of learning to, to go to to go into it and so i have learned i've i've geeked out more about sound stuff and and just podcasting in general than i ever would have thought possible before i mean when i was even when i was starting just starting to listen to podcasts i was like okay i i thought i thought i was being geeky then because i actually had to have a, a specific electronic device for it which um you don't have to do that anymore so that's cool but yeah there's there's a lot of weird tech stuff there that that's that that i've really never even thought about before a certain point in time um and i kind of almost feel like i didn't really realize what i was getting into when i suggested it in the first place so yeah um, I, 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 it turned out to be a pretty, it, a pretty geeky proposition, um, which I, which I find funny now because I mean, you've got podcasts about every possible topic you can think of, including some pretty non geeky stuff. I mean, there's just, there's so many like sports podcasts out there and it's, it's not even, it's. It's it's not even funny how many there are, and you, I mean you're like you, you sit back and think about it. I mean, it, whatever the, whatever the topic of your podcast is, there's a certain geek level involved in just being able to handle the technology to to, to get the thing out there at all. So, yeah. chew, chew on that one. Um, <laughs> the the other one that that, that Liz made me think of um, was. Uh, <laughs> I got really lucky. Um, this would have been summer of 2004. Um, I was on the back end of my master's degree. I was on the kind of on the downhill curve, getting ready to get it finished. Um, and kind of, I mean, not entirely out of the blue because something like that takes a lot of preparation. But um, I was going to a relatively small school. And so there was, there was not just a ton of resources. I mean, I think there were like eight professors in my department. Um, and it just so happened that one of them was a big Tolkien fan. And this is, I think, probably why this made me think of this. You mentioned in Gollum. Um, and it just just and it just so happened that that she was working with with a, a professor in the history department. Um, on f basically, f they were doing whatever they, they were f trying to figure out any way they could figure out a way to actually create a graduate level course for Tolkien. Um, and they managed to do it, and they offered it that summer. And I, like I said, I was there, so I got to sign up for it. So, I mean, that that's kind of the epitome of my. Lord of the Rings geekiness right there is I got to actually take a graduate level course on the Lord of the Rings. Wow. Um, which ended up being a whole lot of fun because if nothing else, like I said, this, this was cross listed as a history course as well. So we were kind of studying it from um, kind of from an Anglo-Saxon history perspective. Um what made this fun was that a lot of the history students, um, good students, one and all, don't get me wrong, but they hadn't really, if they've read Tolkien, it was, it was kind of briefly or in passing or whatever. Um, watching them walk into the class the, the week we were supposed to read the Silmarillion was absolutely hilarious because all of the English, all of the English people that were in this class had read it before so that it was just kind of a, oh yeah i'm just going to buzz through it and kind of freshen up on it a little bit oh no these these poor history people 
They had <laughs> no idea what they were getting into. That's not a novel, people. <laughs> now, admittedly, it's the, it, the closest analog to that book is it's a history textbook. Um, and it's a it's it's not the the best it doesn't have the best flow or anything it's not it's not like a really good history textbook it's kind of a hard to read history textbook and so some of these poor bastards were coming in there and clearly had never read it before and did not know what they were getting into and their eyes were just so glazed over by the time they walked into this classroom it was <laughs> absolutely hilarious <laughs> And those of you got to sit there and giggle the whole time, didn't you? Oh hell yeah, we were having fun with it. I mean, we were we were sympathetic. Don't get me wrong. Um, For about three minutes. Uh, af- well, after the initial round of laughter, for sure. Okay. We, we we did we did laugh as they were walking in the door, and then we consoled them, and then we kind of kept chuckling for the rest of the class. But I mean, it was no slouch. It was a. It was a summer class. It was like a four-hour class yeah. that day. And so, yeah, we got to laugh at them a lot. But, yeah. That, was, that was fun. Poor, poor schmucks. They had no idea what they were getting into. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think the history professor warned them at all, either. <laughs> well, for me... I, I, I kind of already teased it a little bit. One of my geekiest moments was meeting one of, one of my favorite comics creators. And, and, of course, you and the audience go, okay, well, you know, we've all done that. And, but this is a little different. This is a little different. At this convention, I was walking by Jimmy Palmiotti and Amanda Connors' tables. Mm. And I walked up to Jimmy Palmiotti and talked to him for a little bit and all that. Here's where it gets cool. He actually offered me a chair in front of him and sit down and talk. Wow. So I did, and we talked for a while, and of course got the you know the picture taken and all that kind of thing. It's the coolest, one of the coolest memories I've ever remembered as a fan. Now, there has been some cool things that I've experienced when Les and I were going to cons as a part of media, which we fellowship was kind of a media at one point for going attending the cons and, and kind of covering them a little bit. But this was... I, I was there as a member of media, but I, but I was a fan. I was, I guess, I was fan girl. It was awesome, and I, you know, this happened. I can't even tell you how many years ago, but it just remember. I remember it as fresh as yesterday, and I remember several months ago, Hope Nicholson who. Who I follow on Twitter. She's she's a writer and a, and a small publisher in Canada. Uh, she talked about favorite fan experiences or, or or something you know something along those lines. And I I popped on there and I tagged him on Twitter. I said this is one of my favorite memories, and I remember it as clear as crystal. He turned around and followed me. That's cool. And so, and of course, I've been following him, it's, it's, you know, almost from day one. So, uh, such a cool guy. You, you never hear anything bad about him. He's always, seemed like it's always a blast to be around him. And I'm sure our friend Tom Branch has some stories from, because they've, they've hung out a little bit from what I understand. Is that correct, Les? Yes, it is. So, I would love for them to be in town again, and I would offer, I would offer to take them out to dinner and just say, "Hey, let's just let's just talk. It doesn't have to be about comics. It can be just about anything that's going on. But I, let's just talk. Yeah. Let's have some fun." I think he did. Unless he already has other plans, he just seems he is that cool. 
You know, and he's also one on Twitter that's always like, guys, we want you to stop us and say hello to us if you see us, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of nice, you know, because like to us, he's up on a pedestal, but he's like, guys, I'm just I'm regular people. (laughs) You know, I just happen to do what I do good, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He is pretty awesome. Unfortunately, we just lost Les. Apparently, he had a power outage in his house. Uh, it's not just his house. It's apparently, in the neighborhood. So, uh, hopefully, we can get him back to finish up the episode. But if not, then uh, he'll he'll be with us next week. So, we'll, we'll just see. Yep. Kind of weird, but he told us to keep on going. So. Yep. He told us to keep on going. So, we're going to do that. We're going to honor it. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna honor his wishes. So, uh, our second question, or the book, <laughs> came came from uh, a, a long time friend of the uh, of the fellowship, Troy Rogers, uh, from our 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 sister podcast, Sci Fi FX, which sadly is no longer with us. He sent us a very long explanation before the question. And it was kind of an interesting one, but we'll just go ahead and go on to the question. He talks about with the success of the Marvel Cinematic Universe and the passing of Stan Lee, he was wondering if there was a, if there was more of an audience to that would be in, interested in a biopic. And he wanted he he asked he was asking us um, who he thought we would cast, and if there was any other creators that we might uh, do films for, and 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 kind of there was a few more questions. That's that's the general gist of it. Mm-hmm. So I think that if it was anybody else other than Stan Lee. I don't know if it would be well received, but with the Marvel Universe doing so well and with all the cameos he's put in, he's kind of become people's friend and somebody they look for in each movie. Um, I think it would be good, but then uh, this this one had me thinking a lot because he put he gave us a lot of information, which really, really, really made me think about this one, and. As much as I would love to see a Stan Lee movie, there's so much history that that I won't get into. But I I think that was forgiven and moved on that I don't think should be brought up and dredged up again, especially for his fans of the movies. They don't know any of that. They don't know who Ditko is. They don't know who Kirby is. They don't know any of that. And I don't know if I don't know if that's something we should rehash. You know, it's always going to be a, a, a touchy subject. But if I did make this movie, I think I would like to see someone. And bear with me here, guys. Like Kevin Smith, take the story. Um. Kevin Smith was a big fan of Stan Lee's. He loved him. He respected him. And in the last moments of Stan Lee's life was one of the true friends who reached out to him to make sure he was okay and was, you know, kind of a light in the darkness there for, you know, he... See, and I, I don't think that I, I don't know if I would put the ending of his life too much because there was too much speculation of what was going on, but I do know that Kevin Smith played a big part in, like I said, reaching out to him and letting us fans know he's okay, you know, and I think that he would handle it beautifully because he did respect and admire him so much. I don't think he would put anything in there that would um, take away from the man that we love 
you know? So, and as far as playing Stanley, I don't know. I've kicked that one around and tossed that one around, too. And I would I would love someone <laughs> like Tom Hanks, honestly. The way that he's, he's proven he can handle a good character. The only thing that I kept just, you know, kind of kicking back is his age. Because you'd want to go back to the early age and... He's an older man. Now, a younger guy you can make look older, but it's harder to make an older man look younger. So I kind of thought that um, Leonardo DiCaprio, he, he's proven in things like Gilbert Grape. He can play anything. You know, he's <laughs> <laughs> he went from that to Titanic to a you know, serious actor. He's played funny parts and like Once Upon a Time in Hollywood now. So. I think that he would handle it kind of gracefully, too. And I think he would respect that this just wasn't a comic book guy, you know, that he's an icon that people love and respect. I didn't know if we were supposed to answer all of them, but. (laughs) 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 Are we going to break it down? (laughs) Jesus. I hope not, because there were a lot of sort of little sub questions there that I I just sort of picked and chose a bit. Yeah. And of course, any musical score, I'll always go with Danny Elfman. Uh, of course you will. Yeah, of course I would. I was I was half expecting you to start talking about supernatural guys when you <laughs> cast yeah, really. Thing, but yeah. No, no. Yeah. no, no but, Although, no. no, Tom Hanks is a pretty safe bet. Leo DiCaprio is pretty safe too, really. But yeah. Yeah. And I I think they would both, like I said, I would want somebody who would respect the part. You know, and I think they both would do that. They've both won awards. Leo, finally, but they've both won awards for what they do. I, I have to, I have to chuckle a little bit though that, that you're pulling Leo roles from 25 years ago <laughs> for this. But yeah, okay. <laughs> well, that was that was just range, you know. Uh-huh. I, most of the time when people start playing that serious person that everybody thinks so he's a serious actor and he's not he's really not he's been very diverse in the roles he's taken mm-hmm. yes mm-hmm. all the way back to growing pains yeah yeah although i think he should have gotten an award for gilbert Grape. i really do i i did not I mean I was a kid, but I didn't know that that was the same guy from Growing Pains. That's how well he did that part, you know. And once again, that could be a touchy subject to play a you know a mentally handicapped person, and he did it respectfully and beautifully. Cool. Yep. An interesting idea for sure. Mm-hmm. Um. <laughs> so. I, I, I feel a little bad about this one um, because I I have made no bones about the fact that I do not like biopics at all. Um, so this this is a hard one for me because my initial my gut reaction to this is no. <laughs> but that said, no, no at all. I do recognize that they. Are popular. I mean, there especially there've been a couple of really, uh, I don't know how successful they really are. I mean, Bohemian Rhapsody was pretty dang successful. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know how well the the Elton John one did since then, but um, they're selling, so people are buying, people are going and seeing them. So, I mean, and if anybody, if if, if anybody kind of as an icon deserves something like that, Stanley's the guy for sure. Um, I, I think he's worthy of one. Um, does his story, would his story work well in that format? That's the part I'm not sure about. Um, and one of, one of the examples, and, and I'll throw this out here, one of the examples Troy gave was the Tolkien one, which may have something to do with why Tolkien has been on our minds tonight. Um, and how he didn't, he, he, his, his opinion to, to summarize very much, his opinion was that it didn't work for him. And I'll be honest, as much of a Tolkien fan as I am, um, 
I have no, I have never had any interest in seeing a biopic about his life because honestly, his, his life, as it was, uh, not movie material really. I mean, he was a pretty boring guy. Um, he didn't do anything interesting. He was orphaned. Um, was raised by a, by an Anglican priest, um, along with his brother. Um, went to college was really successful in college turned out to be a really good um linguist uh went to went to world war went to the first world war um got sick basically and so got drummed out for that um went back got a job as a professor at oxford and just did that for the rest of his life and that's all he did i mean it's just not a whole lot of story there. My concern with Stan Lee is that, yeah, I mean, he's he's got the iconic stature in the culture to warrant it, but I don't know that his life and career was really all that exciting, and so I'm not sure how well it would translate into a movie. I mean, I'm not looking for it to rival like Raiders of the Lost Ark or anything. But there's there's got to be some degree of dra- I mean the drama stuff is I, I don't know I don't know I'm not sure I'm just not sure how it would translate I'm concerned about it um, and in terms of he 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 mentioned would any would anybody else in in or who else would we other comics creators would be interesting subjects of biopics I don't think there really are any i mean there's there may be a one-off here and there that i don't know about who did something exciting somewhere along the line but it's not i mean we're talking about writers and artists i mean for the most part they both just sort of work a lot (laughs) and so there's i mean there's drama but a lot of times it's the kind of drama that nobody really looks good in Mm mm-hmm I mean, and and I'll throw uh, a semi-random example of this. Um, recently, Howard Chaikin did a, a a miniseries called "Hey Kids Comics." Um, check that out if you want to know what I'm talking about. Um, there's it's it he's it's it's kind of thinly veiled, um, and there's there's some definite uh, I, I, I hesitate to use the term allegory in terms of the comics industry, but it's kind of there. Um, but it's not pretty. Um, this is, this is not a happy story in any way, shape or form. And that's kind of my concern with how a biopic would turn out pretty much regardless of who it was about. Even, right. even someone as well loved and well respected as Stan Lee, mm-hmm. it still just might not look that good on film. That's mm-hmm. kind of my concern. I mean, so I'm, I'm, and so my deal is, I mean, as far as casting Stanley, I mean, my my take on this is there's like, at minimum, three different kind of eras of his career that you could mm-hmm. focus on. Either his his very young days where he basically became the editor. Um, you could pull like the 70s and 80s where he was like really popular and everybody knew who he was, despite the fact that he was in comics. Or like I said, kind of the end times, kind of the the last few years when he kind of was doing the the cameos and the MCU movies and all of that up to the end. Uh, again, I'm not sure any of those eras. I mean, you'd have to you'd have to cast someone someone different for each one because they're drastically different ages. I mean, you take him from like 22 years old at the beginning to the the mid mid late seventies, early eighties, he's I don't know what, in his fifties at that point. Um, to the end where he's I mean he's ninety five when he passed away. You can't cast the same person for each of those. And it like I just I don't know. I had a hard time with it because I just I, yes, I think he deserves it, but I, I don't I don't know that I'd want to I certainly I personally wouldn't want to see it because I just don't like those kinds of movies and I mean, I don't know how to pro- how to proceed with it. You know, on Netflix, I don't know if it's still there or not, but there is kind of a biography 
of Stan Lee, where it's him, you know, he's, he's kind of telling his story. And some of the stories he brought up was pretty interesting to where I, I think what they should do is like update that one, you know, kind of where that one left off in his own words and kind of fill in what happened with the last of it. Cause he, he did go into some of the drama, you know, and, you know, like you were saying, it, 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 it looks bad. It did look bad on everybody. But I think what a lot of people forget is, one, the time period that was. Laws and copyrights and all kinds of things have been developed and have come into play now because of things like that that had happened. You know? Um, people weren't credited for what they did a lot. And he was one of the people who did fight for that. Um, I think of the comic code, once again, he was one of the, the guys on the front line fighting against that. I think he flat out was, I didn't do kids, you know, I'm not doing comics for kids. I'm writing them for adults. And that kind of, so he's, he's done a lot of good things that if for nothing else need to be out there somehow, it, it's, it's, it can't die with him. I think he did too much for the comics in general just for it to, he's gone, you know. Right. And see, this is, this is where I start. Uh, this is where I have trouble because I mean, what you're, what you're describing is a documentary. Yeah. And I love documentaries. I, it, I can giggle my little geek heart out over learning all these cool little interesting details about people, but I'm, I have never had any interest in watching actors pretend to be these people while that's happening. It just yeah. doesn't – it just seems fake and weird to me. And so I agree wholeheartedly that we should have – I mean I, I would love to see five different people come up with different approaches on a Stan Lee documentary yeah. to, just to see the kind of cool and interesting things that come out of that. But I don't have any interest in a biopic, you know. I think it, I think true. it's a, just a different way to tell the story, and it's a way that doesn't appeal to me. Yeah. But yeah, I, I want to know. That. I want to know all the cool little details. I just yeah. would rather hear them told as a real story by the people involved. Or like involved. in that case, he was the one who was telling the story. Right. You know. That, so that, those are some of the better documentaries, in my opinion, mm-hmm. the ones that actually involve the people. Yeah. That. That were in there, that that are that were in the story, that were in the that were living that stuff. I mean, like I said, the 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 one that pops into my head for some reason is the one on Vampira that I watched a month or two ago. Um, that was really interesting because it it stemmed from a long form interview with Myla Nurmi, and so it's her telling these stories. stories yeah she's telling her own story on this stuff most most of it and yeah that's that's way more interesting to me than than some actor's impression of what a director thinks that the writer means in this in all of this and the just the the layers of disconnect in a biopic are just uh so you're not excited to see tom hanks play mr rogers i'm really not <laughs> again Fred Rogers Ooh. is another he's another one of those iconic figures that quote unquote deserves that kind of treatment but I, that kind of treatment is not interesting to me at all I, I think yeah. it, I think it just adds layers of fakeness to something that you don't want that in I mean that, that's the deal my deal is Stan Lee was never that I mean if he was fake it was he was doing it so damn well that it was easy to accept. Yeah. Um, and Fred Rogers was like the most genuine guy ever. Mm-hmm. Really. I mean, and I, 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 I sound hyperbolic saying that, but I mean, he was, the whole deal was he was, he was as genuine as he seemed. And I think Stan Lee to, to the extent that he was, that was that. And to see other people pretending to be, that just seems like missing the point to me. Yeah. I can agree with that. Not trying to shoot Troy's question down or anything, but yeah, it wasn't aimed at me or 
shouldn't have been anyway. (laughs) (laughs) I've, I spent some time thinking about this and even even a little bit more hearing what what y'all were saying. And um, I, I, I just don't know. Uh, yeah, I, I think a documentary would probably be better. I'm, I'm just... You talk about who... who whose, story, whose creator stories would be... But they would have that kind of drama or attention and that kind of thing in their lives. You know, I was, I thought about Siegel and Schuster, but if anything, like you said, it's going to be depressing because from, from their backgrounds to growing, you know, growing up and then becoming, uh, working for, working for what would eventually become DC then creating Superman and then literally losing the rights to that character. Right, having yeah. to fight for the rest of their natural the lives, lives to mm-hmm. get credit for it. For Not only not only get credit, but also get compensated for for a character that a company was literally making billions off of. Mm-hmm. Right. That's and while 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 they're fighting they're fighting to exist. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm reminded of the, of the book that we read, and we did kind of a group, of, uh, kind of a group review where it opens just before the first Superman film debuts and screens, and Schuster is literally laying on bench, sleeping and, on a park bench, right. sleeping on a park bench, and hadn't eaten in a couple of days. I don't know if I want to spend two or three, a couple of hours. Watching something like that—that's right. that's kind of depressing. Yeah. Right. And honestly, I one of the things I have been doing—it's—I haven't been doing it quickly or anything, but I had picked up a my copy of the first collection of the comic book history of comics, mm-hmm. which is an awesome book, by the way. I mean, we've talked about that before too, but. Mm-hmm. And so, I mean, reading back through some of that stuff, and it's got—I mean, it doesn't cover it in a lot of detail obviously because it's covering a lot of ground but yeah i mean there's just it's just constant struggle just for i mean for the slightest recognition or the slightest i mean to, just to get a paycheck they're just at oh man mm-hmm. i mean the, if if any anyone i mean if we're going to step away from stan lee if anybody in my eyes would would justify a, some sort of biopic it would be jack kirby and yeah. honestly, it would be his early career and the fact, I mean, joining the military, that whole, he would, that, that part of his life, that early part of his life would be the only part that I think would be in any way an interesting movie. Because, I mean, he legitimately went and fought Nazis and then came back and became, a, came back to being a comic book artist. I mean, that's, that's badass. But the stuff that he had to go through as a comic book artist back then was just terrible. Well, mm-hmm. not only as a comic book artist, but as a Jewish comic book artist. Right. It that, gets, I mean, you, you throw that in the mix and it gets really damn depressing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's just, uh, and I, I mean, I, uh, it would be hard to watch. Because yeah. there's, there's not, I mean, there's just not a lot of, the, the happy stories are the stuff like Liz's story with with the with the Green Power Ranger and stuff like that, but that's honestly that's removed from the everyday life of the comic book creator or the in this case the the TV actor. It's 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 the individual story that that matters. There yeah, and yeah. That, that's the that's the cool story and that's I mean how do you capture that in a movie you can't capture that in a movie you can't because he was his fans you know right and that's it's 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 all a question of how they reflect back from the mirror of fandom that's that's hard to capture that's probably, yeah I don't know I don't know how you would go about capturing I mean I've I've not been to film school or anything, but I don't know how you would go about capturing that. I really don't. 
So it's a tough one. Really. In a documentary. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> yep, that's how you do it. Yep, you do it in a, in a format that allows you to go talk to fans, like a documentary. Yeah. So, yeah, it's a, it, it's a good and very tough question. So thanks, Troy. <laughs> <laughs> if you wanted to do a movie centered on Stanley and you would do something po- positive, yeah, I, I guess you would do something like a – Maybe something loosely based on a fan experience, but it'd be pretty much a fiction. You're not really telling a story. You're not really, and I don't want to say he's, you're not telling the truth. It could be some truth, and it could be based, you know, based on things before. But I just, unless, unless you, unless you really, I mean, the only thing that I can think of, I, I'm sure, I'm sure he's had a lot of positives because he's had in this in his career, but the major positive in his life. Was his wife? That's what I was saying, Joan. Joan. I mean, the whole, the, the whole. If you want to, if you want to do a movie, and that's been kind of the bait, and that's kind of the what it focuses on. The main focus mm-hmm. is their love, because according to the story, is he met her when he was meet, picking up her roommate to go on a date, and actually took her out, and it was. And proposed that night, if 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 I'm remembering the mm-hmm. story correctly. So it was literally love at first sight, and they were all, and they were, you know, if you want to do something like that, and then make the whole comics and all that kind of the backstory and all that. Okay, maybe you could do that. Maybe. <laughs> See now, be careful, because my understanding is that that's a lot of what the Tolkien biopic did. Okay. Was his relationship with his wife. Because she was she was a big inspiration for him too. And so just, just, I don't know if you could discuss the relationship without the comics. Because from him well, well, saying yeah. she, you know and I'm sure he had a lot of bad, bad days that she was there for that too, you know. Now I want to see that story. <laughs> I'm always a sucker for a good love story, though. But the way he talked about her and the way he looked at her, that was true love. And I think he would have given up everything in his life for her. I mean, that's all I'm saying. I mean, I mean, yeah, you can talk about how he he literally grew up in comics because he was like, a, I think he was like a copy boy or something like that. In the early days, something, some, something along those lines, and where he was like, given a chance to write comics, and then how he, you know, basically, you know, he came up with the Marvel universe. I mean, obviously there was others involved. I mean, we, we've we've gone over that several times. So mm-hmm. yeah. anyone who gets upset with me saying that, you know that that's not exactly that's. That's not the way I feel. But, you know, okay. And then where do you go from there? I mean, because he went, I, I just, I don't know. I'm not sure. Yep. It's a tough one. Yep. So I do, we do thank, thank you for your questions. Definitely. Yep. And uh, if this inspires you to ask us some questions for a future episode, by all means, send them our way. Bring it on. Yeah. We like and we lot. also like to hear your geekiest moments. Well, there, there We've embarrassed ourselves. We'd like to hear yours. <laughs> there, you go. there you go. And on that note, we're going to take a quick break and be back with our weekly picks. And we're back. It's time for our weekly picks. And leading off is Liz. All right. Um, For my first pick, I'm going with one from Zenoscope called The Watcher. Um, This is going to be a three-issue horror thriller. Um, Basically, a priest moves into a, a haunted house, which, well, there's rumors of it being haunted. He doesn't know for sure. 
But then his daughter starts having trouble sleeping and stuff. And she thinks there might be some truth to this. And then her friends are murdered. So, hmm, maybe. <laughs> so we shall see how this one goes. Like I said, it's a um, it's going to be three issues. So the story should be fast and pretty good. It's by Ralph Tedes- Tedesco. Yeah. So should be pretty good. I'm excited about this one. And the cover to this one, I don't know why, reminded me of Preacher. <laughs> Maybe it's the priest in the church behind him. I don't know. <laughs> uh, could be. <laughs> could be. <laughs> yeah, I'm kind of curious about this one, too. Yeah. Sounds creepy. Xenoscope mm-hmm. does a pretty good job with that, so, you know. They do. Yeah. All righty, Mike? Okie dokie. Um, not surprisingly, from our given our last episode... Um, my first pick is an Action Lab comic, and I am picking the collection of the Volume 2 of Spencer and Locke, um, because, yeah, it's it's out already, um, so yay. Um, yay. Looking forward to that. Um, go, get, if you did not, I mean, it, it would be best to, to read Volume 1 first, obviously, but um, you can you can follow along with Volume 2 pretty easily if you, if you wanted to, but yeah, it's awesome stuff. Yeah. Great crime, great crime book. Got some, a few funny moments. It's not, it's not a ha ha book for sure, but no, it's, it's pretty dang dark, and that's that's and that's how I like it. So, go check it out. Mm-hmm. All righty. Uh, I'm next, and for my first choice, it's a new miniseries from Boom Studios called Once in Future. And it's about a group of quote-unquote nationalists who use the ancient artifact to bring back a villain from an Arthurian myth to gain power. But to stop them, we have an ex-monster hunter who escaped from a retirement home and grabs her grandson to stop them. Okay, is that not an interesting premise right there? <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm in. <laughs> and, and this is written by Kieran Ker- Gillen, who you may have read *The Wicked and Divine*. That was his book. That just wrapped up. It just wrapped up. Um, and he's actually writing *Die*. Which That's true. is another fun book. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, yeah, you're good. Uh, so, uh, I, I'm so in. This, I, just the whole premise. And, and of course, the art's by Dan Mora, who did the first arc on Buffy the Vampire Slayer, but you probably know him from doing the Claws books. With, with Grant, uh, Morrison. Grant Morrison, so yep. yep. definitely, definitely check that out. Awesome, definitely. Yep. Now. Mm-hmm. Yep. Alrighty, Liz. All right, my second pick is another first called Stray from Dark Horse Comics. I had to pick this one. A <laughs> a girl makes a device where she can talk to her cat. I mean, how cool is that? Who doesn't want to talk to their pet? I mean, just that story and I'm sold. But this cat has special powers that he can astral project anywhere in the galaxy that he wants to. Well, apparently, her government, they never really say in all the the previews I've read and everything else if it's the government. But um, they want this thing that she has that she uses to talk to her cat and stuff. And... Yeah, so I guess this is part of trying to get away from them and the adventures of her and her cat. So far, what I've seen from the art, it's amazing. So should be a good story with good art. A talking cat, what more could you ask for? <laughs> An astral projecting talking cat. <laughs> there you go. That darn cat. Wow. Yeah. 
<laughs> uh, oddly enough, it does sound interesting. I mean, it definitely cool? sounds weird, but it's but uh, hey, I'm not I'm not going to sneeze at weird. I like yeah. weird. Hey. Alrighty, Mikey, you're up again. Okie dokie. So my second pick is from IDW, and this is a collection from uh, cartoonist Shannon Wheeler. Um, it is his new collection is called Why Did We Trust Him? Um, and you know, I mean, it's it's a collection of mostly single panel st- comics, so it, there, there's it's not like there's a, a, a major story involved here, but. Shannon Wheeler is a really good cartoonist, and so he he, he he's done some really cool stuff. Um, uh-huh. So check it out, new stuff from him. Yeah, Eisner Award winning cartoonist. Just saying. Yeah, I like his I like his work too. I definitely like his his last his last book. Uh, so it's it's cool to see he's, that that new that new collection's coming out. All righty. For my second choice, I'm going with a new book from Mad Cave Studios. It's called Shows In, written by Anthony Cleveland, with art by Jefferson Stadzinski. And it's a story of a 12-year-old girl in during the 20s, 20s Georgia, who runs away and joins a traveling freak show. But if they're not so happy to start off to have her there until apparently start, they start learning what secrets she may be hiding. And apparently these are going to be incredibly freaky. So who knows? This, this sounds very offbeat, maybe? It's it definitely, it's definitely piqued my interest. So I'm, I'm mm-hmm. going to check this one out. Yeah, sounds cool. I'll be getting this one too. <laughs> I like freak shows. <laughs> oh, well, that's a good thing you're a part of one here then. Huh? <laughs> All right. It's a geek show. It's a geek show. <laughs> you're up again, Liz. All right. Um, my third pick is called The White Trees, and it's from Image Comics. This is Chip Sardusky. What did I say? I, hopefully I said his name right. But um, two issues, 40 pages, so it's going to be an oversized issue for us. Um, it's about three guys who, I don't know, from the cover, it kind of reminds me of Lord of the Rings, an elf, big burly guy, and then like a dwarf. <laughs> So they they fought hard. They fought the war. It's over. They live in peace. Twenty years later, their kids come up missing. So they kind of got a band together, get their kids back, and still manage to keep peace. So should be a good story. Like I said, two issues, short read, chips are dusky. It should be amazing. Uh, yeah, he's he's got an interesting mind. That one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he does. Yep, that he does. Cool. Yep. Mm-hmm. All righty, Mikey. Okie dokie. Third pick is from Boom Studios, and this is actually another trade. This is the trade for Sparrowhawk, um, and this is a book I've talked about before. Um, the main character is uh, she's an she's an illegitimate daughter, um, and she gets in the very first issue she gets dragged into the fairy realm and has to figure out how to kind of fight her way back to her to get home even though she kind of realizes along the way that she isn't really all that thrilled about home to begin with um so she faces she was facing some eh, i'll call it abuse um as she's a teenager and it's just, yeah, just not necessarily the happiest story, mind you, but, um, very interesting uh, and a lot of, a lot of fun, a lot of cool ideas floating around in here. Um, 
So it's definitely worth checking out. Some, some, it's a good story. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I remember enjoying that book. It'll be cool to kind of go back and read that again. So, uh, I am up. So for my third choice, I'm going with IDW Publishing, and that's the fourth issue of Star Trek Year Five. Uh, this has been kind of an interesting little run, and with this is this issue is the second part of a new story arc that finds the Enterprise uh, revisiting a classic uh, Trek story. If you're familiar with the episode, a piece of the action, which was the story of a book of gangsters that basically polluted the the culture of, of the planet. If you remember correctly, the episode ended with McCoy realizing he left his communicator on the planet. This is the follow-up. This is the this this is this is the damage. We see what the damage has been done. And it's been this is the last issue ended on a what the hell moment. So we got to do a follow up and see where we're going from here. Because uh, one of the characters does something that's kind of, you going, really? Okay, this is actually the way we're going to, we're going to actually try to undo all the damage. We're going to do that. Okay. Uh, so it's been, it's been fun so far. Uh, there's, there's a continuing, subplot regarding uh, the resolution of the first story arc. And I'm trying to figure out where that's going to go because it could possibly lead to a war with the Thillians, depending on how things go. So it's been... So this has been an interesting read so far. And I'm, I'm totally digging this new story arc, so i got to know where we're, gonna, where we're going, especially off that ending. Interesting. Mm. Yeah. All righty. Any special shout outs this week? Well, I have one. Um, I was actually going to mention this earlier, and I kind of got sidetracked on my baby shark rant. Um, See, those rants are not good for you, Liz. All right. I just lose my mind. Um, Since we have moved our podcast, I don't know if we got a whole lot of background stuff, but we used to record on Tuesdays, and now we record on Sundays. But um, Tuesday nights were open now, and I have a friend named Raven who does these really amazing paintings. Um, She does a Facebook Live. They're usually from... I'm wanting to say from 8 o'clock to 10 o'clock. I could be wrong on that. It could be 9 o'clock, or I just don't get there till 9 o'clock. Or, it's, but, usually, it's usually about 9 o'clock central time, yeah. Yep. And she's just a really fun, bur- bubbly person, so she's really easy to watch. And um, like I said, some of the stuff that she cranks out is just amazing. So if you're interested in art, I had never really thought, about doing what she does so I'm kind of like dumbstruck with some of the stuff she comes up with but it's like pouring paint but the pictures she comes up with I mean of course we all see something different but it's usually I said it's it's, you you just have to see it to understand what I'm talking about but her name is Raven Um, I'll copy her Facebook link so you guys can go check that out if you'd like to. I believe she also sells her paintings, but I said just to watch her and her element and the conversation that's going on during when these are being done, it's it's really awesome. So Yes, because I'm on there giving her a little grief. Yes, I, I do tease her quite a bit. Yep. <laughs> like, yes, she's... She, so she has fun. A, yeah, she and she does have a brand new website, and we'll we'll have a link to her Facebook page and and the website up when obviously we'll be here with the show notes. So yep. okay, 
any other shout outs other to Les? I'm sorry we you lost your pow- last power, but he'll be yes, back. We back that week. bus up too hard. Knock the power out. <laughs> he ran it into the transformer and blew out the whole neighborhood. I'm sure, they'll be back in the Stone Age in no time. So, with no other special shout outs, we'll go ahead to our regular ones. Uh, uh, first of all, I want to thank Pop Goes Culture Network for allowing us to be part of their network. Uh, uh, definitely check out our fellow podcast there. There will be linked in the show notes. Uh, thank you for your support. And we also want to thank the support of the Potter family who retweet our shows every week on Twitter. Uh, definitely go check them out. Uh, the easiest way to do that is to uh, search hashtag Potter and family, one word. And any shows kind of catch your eye, download it, and hopefully you have a lot of fun listening to that show. Definitely go check them out. Uh, hey, the Martyr, thank you for the, the music that we use for our podcast. We'll have a link to their EPs. Definitely check out their music. Thank you guys so very, very much. And finally, you, dear listener, thank you for downloading and listening to today's episode. We do appreciate your support. We'd love to hear from you. We value your feedback. Questions? We definitely want some questions. Uh, observations, complaints, suggestions, whatever. Love to hear from you. There's several ways you can do that. Uh, our email address is email at the fellowship of, of the geeks dot net. Or you can go to the website and click on the about us tab. And there's a contact form there that you can fill out. By all means, follow us on social media. We, I mentioned earlier a uh, Facebook page, The Fellowship of the Geeks. And obviously we're on Twitter, at Fellowship Geeks. By all means, follow us if you like, and you can contact us through those those particular sources of show, social media. Uh, if you'd like to follow our personal Twitter accounts, by all means, you can. Uh, Mike can be found at Mikey Geek. Liz can be found at LN underscore geek. And I can be found at Tom TC Geek. And wherever you download our episodes, we would greatly appreciate it if you would rate and review us. Thank you very much. Oh, I got I got to mention this. After hounding her for forever, we finally <laughs> got a bio on 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 the from Liz on the About Us page. So go def, go check that out. About <laughs> what? So we're finally all there. Yay! Yay! <laughs> Any final thoughts before we say goodbye? Uh, just thanks, everybody. Yep, thank you, everyone. And on behalf of Les, who would thank you, and I thank you for listening. And until next time, geek on, my friends. We thank you for listening to the show. Comments, suggestions, and questions can be sent to email at thefellowshipofthegeeks.net. You can follow us on Facebook at The Fellowship of the Geeks and on Twitter at Fellowship Geeks. Until next time...